In Jackson, Mississippi, school drop-off isn't just for the kids. It's also for the water. The entire city is facing a boil water notice again. We're told don't wash your hair with the water, don't brush your teeth with the water. Lakeisha Galilan worries about her eight-year-old. Is she going to walk over to a water fountain and drink from that water fountain? To be safe, signs are up at the middle school. They've been there a long time. You can't remember a time when the kids could use the water fountains in the school? I can't remember. I honestly can't remember. George Stewart has taught here for six years, a predominantly black, low-income school. On mm -hmm. top of all the other challenges, water quality and water pressure are a constant battle. At one point, we had to shut down for about two weeks. When? Uh, this was like maybe like a year or two ago. In the middle of the pandemic? Absolutely, absolutely. Class went virtual. Kids fell further behind. We have many students who um, consider some of our were most vulnerable students who um, virtual learning does not help them at all. The problem here, like so many other places, is failing infrastructure. This is one of two water treatment facilities in Jackson and the one largely to blame for the most recent citywide boil water notice. And officials still can't tell people when the water will be safe to drink again. In 2020, an EPA report cited a long list of problems with the water system, including failure to replace lead pipes, faulty monitoring equipment, inadequate staffing. There's been a failure to recognize this as a uh, unified problem, you know, as, as a problem both on the state uh, and even at times the federal level, understanding that we lived in an aging uh, America. Shokwe Antar Lumumba is Jackson's mayor. Good evening and welcome everyone to the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition's Thursday night event, U.S. at the Crossroads, an American system of industrial recovery or Fed Chair Powell's nightmare recession. For decades, the driver of the U.S. economy has been consumer spending. Our policies, our taxation have resulted in driving manufacturing overseas in order to get the lowest possible price per unit. Spending on our infrastructure has languished, and now with the global supply chain shortage, we are seeing the consequences. Not enough production on the supply side, an inability to manufacture here in the US, industry consolidation, and rampant inflation. Now the Fed says they have an answer for us. Uh, they wanna raise interest rates, which they are doing, to cut down on consumer demand but we think there's another solution. And that's what we wanna explore this evening in the presentations from our speakers is what our economy would, would look like if we pivoted to making the investment in infrastructure across our country. My name's Julie Olson, I'll be your moderator this evening. And uh, with that, I would like to go uh, right to our speakers. Um, we've got quite a lineup this evening and I'm sure you'll find their presentations very interesting. Uh, so why don't we go to uh, the first one on our list, Alfeka Mutardi, who's a former senior economist with the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Alfeka, uh, tell us about the Infrastructure Bank. Thank you very much, Julie, and thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Alfeka Mutardi. I'm a macroeconomist with the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank. Um, I'd like to give you a quick rundown on uh, how the bank works because we have some new callers on this call this evening um, who are not quite familiar with it. So my apologies to those who have already heard this. And then I'd like to uh, open up uh, with a little bit of look taking a peek at where we are with the economy and uh, money policy and what the outlook is and what our state of infrastructure is to set up for other speakers who are gonna talk about this as well. So to get started, uh, we uh, have a bill in Congress, of course, as you know, HR 3339. And look at this, we're now up to 17 co-sponsor, hallelujah. And thank you to all of the, the, the legislators, the activists, everybody across the country who has been talking doggedly with their members of Congress to get them signed on board. This, this uh, methodology really works. Uh, we've added new co-sponsors in California, Michigan, and elsewhere. Uh, and so uh, we're actively looking to increase this number of co-sponsors and uh, get on board Republicans and Democrats alike. So this is the way the National Infrastructure Bank works. It is um, modeled on uh, the earlier four banks that came before it. Uh, we This is not a new idea. It's worked well in our nation's past under very poor economic circumstances like we're entering into today. And uh, it really is a, a salvation for the country. Uh, that started after the American Revolutionary War with Alexander Hamilton and George Washington. 
and went through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation of FDR. These banks are not around any longer. They had a 20 year sunset clause, but they were very successful, built most of our nation's infrastructure. So our um, our proposal for a fifth bank is modeled on the other, other earlier four. Uh, quickly, it is capitalized by going to the private sector, asking them to sell in treasuries they are holding in exchange for preferred stock. That makes these investors silent partners. They get paid a little bit extra in the process, and that extra stream of money comes out of the earnings from the NIB's loans. This bank is self-sufficient. It doesn't require big money from uh, budgets to get it started or subsidize its operations. And then it goes on to work just like a commercial bank. The capital sits on the bank's books, acts like a rainy day fund. The bank gives out loans. When it gives out a loan, it actually creates a deposit. And when you create an extra deposit like that, you're creating money. Commercial banks created 90% of our nation's money supply, uses cash on hand to move money out of that newly created deposit through the rest of the banking system. Loans are very advantageous, low cost interest rates for borrowers. Borrowers would be state and local governments, any public entity that owns a piece of public infrastructure, be it a road, a bridge, a school, can come in directly for a, an improvement loan from the NIB. We cover $5 trillion in projects. A half of this estimation of need came from the American Society of Civil Engineers who, who keep track of these things. They, they've noted that we have this big, huge backlog. Because we have not financed infrastructure over so many years, we have a big backlog, and we need trillions of dollars to repair transportation systems, water systems, upgrade our electric power grid. We also need a complete high-speed rail network all across the country to improve our transportation. We put in extra money for that. Also for broadband, affordable housing, 7 million units, and some large-scale water projects to address drought in the Southwest where we grow half of our nation's food supply. So where do we stand on the economy? This is what's happening. Uh, now, because the Fed over a long period of time has been printing too much money, uh, we now ha are having uh, high inflation. Uh, it's up to eight and a half percent for uh, the, the com consumer price index, uh, a little bit less than that for a different uh, different measure of, in of inflation. But this has really caused a stir. And now the uh, Federal Reserve, who is responsible for the money supply in our country, wants to cut down on demand by soaking back up the money supply. This is uh, because they think that inflation is caused by too much money or demand chasing too few goods or too little supply. So what they're going to do, they think they believe that workers are the cause of all this, that they have too much money because we have a tight labor market that they're living uh, you know, high off the hog. Uh, what they're going to do, their policy is to cut back the money supply. It's called quantitative tightening or QT. They're, that They're also going to raise interest rates and that's going to uh, soak up the money supply so that, they're, that there's less borrowing and less demand. And that will set, plunge us into a, a recession. Uh, they're looking to increase uh, broadly unemployment. This is Larry Summers idea that we're going that what we need is to move, move uh, the unemployment rate from three and a half percent where it currently is up to maybe six percent per year for the next five years and that will uh, that high unemployment will wind up cutting wages across the board this is a completely irresponsible policy why uh, we just got finished spending seven trillion dollars uh, and raising our national debt by that much we raised it by 32% to get us out of the COVID recession. And now we're gonna plunge ourselves into a new recession. Keep in mind these higher interest rates uh, will have to be paid by the US government as well. And higher interest rates on the national debt, this increased, uh, it's up to 30.9 trillion now, uh, will really take uh, soak up all of our revenues in the budget. We'll have less money left over to spend on other things. This is gonna be bad for the fiscal. Also, workers do not have too much money. Real wages declined over the past decade. Look at this, 40% of Americans can't pay their rent or buy food. 1.6 Americans million Americans are still out of the workforce compared to before COVID. Why? Because they can't afford to work. Transportation costs too much. Um, uh, um, Childcare and elder care costs too much. They also many of them have long COVID. Uh, so we we uh, what we have what we the people that have too much money on their hands are the top ten percent 
of income earners. We need to tax them uh, if we're really going to uh, soak up this extra demand. Demand depression does nothing to increase the supply of goods. That's the other side of the inflation question. Powell admits that quantitative tightening will not lower food or gas prices. So what is the point in doing it with a, a sledgehammer and running our economy into a recession? Also, this policy totally ignores the devastating effect of a recession that has on businesses and banks. 32% of small businesses today say they can't pay their rent. Uh, corporations that are uh, troubled corporations that are buy that are adding debt onto debt onto debt. These are called junk bonds. Uh, that that amount of debt has doubled over the last decade to 1.5 trillion. It's on the books of banks, and um, chunks of it are going becoming overdue right now, even before we go into a recession. That will help if they can't pay their loans back. That will help hit the <coughs> sector. Falling stock prices. Uh, setting up margin calls, uh, leveraged, uh, hugely interleveraged mega banks sitting on $200 trillion of derivatives. All these are ticking time bombs that could set off a, a new financial crisis. So that's the uh, economy side. Where are we on the infrastructure side? Also not looking good. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi, we're going to have speakers talk about this. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi's water disaster developed over decades because there was not enough money in budgets to fix it. Jackson is in the news, but we have many other cities across the nation from Baltimore all the way over to Honolulu, Hawaii that have poor drinking water, quality water problems that need to be fixed right away. Los Angeles, California, facing extreme homelessness and housing insecurity for decades also, the, worst, the nation's worst traffic congestion, Record heat this summer and uh, record heat is straining uh, and air conditioning is straining their electric power grid and they may be, may be facing rolling blackouts. We have, we're have we entering into our third year of drought and water cutbacks in the Southwest where we grow half of our nation's food supply. Uh, add to that, we've had record rainstorms and wildfires destroying costly infra infrastructure. Uh, here's a picture of a farmer in uh, um, uh, uh, Central California uh, watching as a tractor destroys his 70 acre organic asparagus field, uh, which he had to plow under because he had no water to water it with. Pennsylvania townships are selling off utilities uh, to plug to get fast money to plug their budget holes. Uh, this is causing rates uh, for these users to go up by 50 to 90%. We were gonna have some uh, new uh, information about uh, what's going on with this privatization, uh, um, you know, blocking it. Uh, we still have potholes everywhere. All the roads are not fixed. Washington State, Indiana, and Michigan have the worst pothole problems in the nation. Costs every motorist uh, upwards of $700 a year in repair costs to their cars because of the potholes. Look at this, the, the infrastructure bipartisan bill that was passed last year uh, gave most of its money for roads and bridges, but compared to what the American Society of Civil Engineers say we need to fix the whole thing, they're only going to provide 14% of the new money that's needed to fix roads and bridges. So uh, what, uh, what we're told by members of Congress is there's no more money coming from the federal budget for infrastructure. That's it. The bipartisan law was it. We passed the in, in, uh, in Inflation Reduction Act just recently. Uh, it excluded any money for high-speed rail. Uh, what we're seeing is that what the, those two programs are about all they're going to be for some period of time to come. So what can the National Infrastructure Bank do? Actually, it is a better way to fight inflation, save jobs, and curb a recession. Why? First of all, it's a proven solution. It can lean against a recession in the same manner that a previous bank the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did when it leaned against the Great Depression and hired workers who were unemployed. It also lends only into the real sector for infrastructure improvements that really stretch out and uh, oversize uh, their uh, impact on the economy. $5 trillion over 10 years to fix the entire backlog of infrastructure projects. We could start on year one, day one, with shovel-ready projects like the Jackson, Mississippi water problem, um, 
the Los Angeles uh, backlog of problems, uh, New Mexico, every place else, we could start with their backlogs of projects. We'll create 25 million new great family sustaining jobs. We can hire unemployed workers right away, especially low income workers that need jobs the most. The re legislation requires that workers be paid Davis-Bacon wages. Those are almost union level scale wages. Uh, and we can ramp up training programs so that workers can earn while they learn. We prevent further food price inflation by increasing water supplies to the Southwest, both from piped water and primary water. We're gonna have uh, a, a speaker about this. Uh, we help to supply, uh, to resolve other supply chain problems like uh, that occurs at ports, trucking, uh, lack of uh, affordable housing. Uh, all of this will grow small businesses. Uh, we have a, a strong climate change benefit because we're putting more rail into the transportation mix and saving on fuel and renew we're going to move to renewable agriculture. So the scope and type of spending, that $5 trillion, sharply raises economic growth and productivity. It makes the economy more efficient. Trucks move faster, that kind of thing. That was proven by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation during the Great Depression. So, and we can prevent any a meltdown of small and medium businesses and any meltdown of state and local finance revenues that would uh, would be caused by a recession. So this complements budgets everywhere, and we can do it all with no new federal spending, taxes, or debt that's needed. This is passable legislation. So let's go ahead and get it done. Thank you. Thanks, Alfeca, for that great presentation. Uh, next, I'd like to go to the um, Edward Cornell Professor of Law and Finance from Cornell Law School, uh, Professor Robert Hockett. Great. Uh, thanks, Julia. Thanks again, Alfeca. Um, so I think maybe the best thing I can do here is maybe provide a little bit of uh, historical context uh, in order to make clear uh, what the historic significance is, uh, of, or at least what some of the historical significance is uh, of what Alfeca has just put before you, uh, and how it really amounts to a kind of reversal uh, of about 50 years of ridiculous, of a ridiculous mistake, right? A terrible error, and hence a resumption uh, of a great American tradition that was more or less continuous until about 50 years ago. So I'll open with a sort of striking and maybe even somewhat disturbing image, and then I'll explain why that image is actually fitting and apt, um, and then talk about how what Elfeka has just sort of recommended amounts to a kind of undoing um, of what I'm going to describe in that image. So imagine, here's the image, imagine that you're um, a, you know, a reasonably um, athletic or, or sort of lively sporting sort of person and you love playing volleyball and you love playing soccer, you're, you're physically active, you run a lot, you swim a lot and you're basically able-bodied. And then one day for some reason, um, you know, that you can't really explain, uh, you walk into a hospital and you ask them to amputate your right arm uh, and to amputate your right leg and to take out the right side of your brain, right? Just to remove half of your brain and remove, you know, two of your limbs, right? One of each of your two of your four limbs. Um, and then after you heal up, you say, I'm going to try to be active again. I'm going to keep running, but I'm going to try to figure out how to run on one leg. I'm going to keep playing volleyball, but I'm going to try to figure out how to keep playing volleyball with just one arm. I'm going to keep doing crossword puzzles and other things, but only using half of my brain and just kind of go on and sort of gratuitously handicap yourself like that and then just try to uh, do all the things that you used to do. Well, there's a sense in which we've been doing that for the last 50 or more years. And here's what I mean by that. Up until about 50 years ago or so, in the great tradition of political economy and in political economic policy as practiced here in the US, we tried to avoid uh, excessive inflations and we also tried to avoid the opposite of those, deflations, all better known as depressions, but also recessions, recessions and depressions. And the way we did that was by recognizing that there are two components. There are in effect two limbs, right? There are two arms and two legs that we have to sort of work with. On the one hand, we had money supplies, to put it sort of crudely. And on the other hand, we had goods and services supplies. And if you had too much money chasing too few goods and services, there was a danger of inflation. 
If on the other hand, you had too little money chasing too much in the way of goods and services, there was a danger of deflation, of recession, of depression. And so the key to good economic policy was maintaining a kind of balance between these two things. And what that meant was you try to be as productive as possible for one thing and keep producing and adding to the material wealth of your society and doing it, of course, in environmentally sustainable ways and doing it in inclusive ways that are just and fair to the entirety of the citizenry. But with those, you know, with those sort of desiderata in mind, the name of the game is to produce and to advance materially, to make life better materially each year or each decade or whatever. And then you modulate money supplies in such a way as to enable that continuous production without hiccups or interruptions. So you don't want there to be sudden stoppages owing to a sudden shortage of money, but you also don't want there to be sudden inflations that start taking away the value of money. So you work both on the production side of the economy or what we might call the supply side on the one hand, and then you work on the monetary side of the economy or what could also be called the effective demand side on the other, right? Now, for whatever reason, about 50 some odd years ago, a little bit more than 50 years ago, we decided just again, gratuitously to kind of amputate the right arm, the right leg and the right brain. That is to say, we stopped talking about production and we stopped thinking about production and economic theory stopped paying attention to production. And the sort of apotheosis of this strange gratuitous self lobotomization of orthodox economics is nicely captured in a little slogan that we often hear quoted these days from Milton Friedman, a conservative right-wing economist best known for having inspired uh, Augusto Pinochet and all of the glorious things that he did for Chile. And also, of course, well known as an economic advisor to Richard Nixon, the greatest president before Donald Trump. Now, what did what what is this quote by Friedman? Well, Friedman is off quoted as saying inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And I'm sort of fond of saying that that is always and everywhere half true in the same sense that a person with only a left arm and a left leg and a left brain is physically half of what the person sort of was. What do I mean by that? Well, it's not simply a monetary phenomenon. It's a money in relation to goods and services problem or phenomenon, right? And what that means in turn is that if you are finding inflationary pressures developing, there are sort of two sides of the equation from which you can act, right? You can act from the monetary side, but you can also act from the goods and services side, right? But for the last 50 years, we just don't have that side. We just, you know, production is not a thing. Production doesn't happen. Production, production doesn't exist. And just in case you were wondering or thinking that it might still exist, say, in the early 1990s, we're going to ship it all off elsewhere. We're going to have China do all of the producing, or we're going to have other, we're going to offshore all of our productive capacity. And in doing that, we're, of course, we're going to take away the, the sort of good paying union jobs that made it possible for there to be an American middle class. So that now instead we replace the old middle class with what has come to be called the precariat people who basically are stuck, you know, in little, in very underpaid service jobs, flipping burgers or, you know, the like, right? That kind of thing. So what we have now is a circumstance where when finally you actually see, thanks to some salutary policies that have been pursued by the Biden administration, you actually finally see wages and salaries beginning to go up. You see labor markets tightening so that labor's bargaining power is coming back and you have heroic people starting to unionize sectors of the economy that previously had not been unionized like Starbucks places, for example, and Amazon warehouses and the like. What happens? Oh my God, so there's inflation happening. And here comes Jerome Powell and uh, of course, Larry Summers and little Larry Summers Jr. That is to say, Mr. Furman coming out and saying, oh, you know, we've got this terrible inflation problem developing. And, but don't talk to me about production or the supply side of the economy, because remember, we amputated all of that decades back. We can't work on that side. So what are we going to have to do? Well, we're going to have to tell a bunch of people, I know you've got a job finally, and I know that finally it looks as though your future is getting a little bit brighter and you kind of know where your next meal is coming from. But I'm sorry, we have this inflation problem, even, you know, and, and never mind the fact, of course, that profit 
ratios or profit rates that are being gleaned by large corporations are at record highs, literally historical record highs. Ignore that component of price. Ignore, in other words, the profit component of price. And just look at the wage component. And you go to these people and you say, you know, I'm sorry, I know you got a job now and things are getting a little better and bargaining power is improving and your wages might even go up. In fact, your fat, your um, your store or your warehouse might unionize, but we're just going to have to take your job away from you because prices are going up too fast. So we're just going to have to throw you out of work. And uh, Jason Furman, of course, just today, or maybe it was just yesterday, said that we're going to have to um, have unemployment of about 6.5% for at least several years if we want to get that inflation under control. Larry Summers, of course, as Alfeca mentioned, had said, said something similar, but he talked in terms of 6% for five years or, take your pick, 10% for two years. If you remind yourself furthermore that the rate of Black American unemployment typically is double that of white unemployment, then in effect, what Larry Summers is saying, I'm sorry, one out of every five African American citizens, you're, we're just going to have to take your job away so that we can you know, get this inflation problem under, under wraps. And if somebody says, well, what about the record high profit? Oh, well, that would be price controls. We don't do that. You know, That's not capitalist. So sorry, guys, uh, but we're going to have to impose either a 20% unemployment rate on you for a couple of years or if we want to go a little bit easier, we'll do the Jason Furman thing. And we'll say, if you're African-American, you're going to have to have a 13% unemployment rate. So that's more than one out of every 10. And it's just so that we can get those prices down because we can't produce more goods and services. Because remember, we amputated all of that 50 years ago. All we can do is tinker with the money supply. And one way, of course, to tinker with the money supply is to throw people out of work. Um, so that's what we're sort of stuck with. That's what we're sort of faced with. And what we're sort of waiting for is for somebody to walk into the room and say, hey, wait a minute. Now, you know, you didn't really actually literally amputate those limbs 50 years ago. What you had was somebody tie them up so that you couldn't use those limbs. And now that we're now that you're now that I've drawn your attention to it, if you look, you'll notice that your your right arm is tied down, your right leg is tied down, your right brain is still in there. It just got sort of injected with Novocaine or something so that you can't think with that half of your brain. But you can actually wash that crap out and you can untie that arm and that leg and then you can sort of shake them out a little bit and get the blood flowing again so that now you actually are a full able bodied economy again, so to speak speak. And what does that amount to? What am I, what, what is that a sort of metaphor for? Well, it's essentially a metaphor for what Alfeca was just describing, right? We can take production back. We can take, we can reassume control over production. We could reshore the production. It's clear that we're kind of having to now anyway, because of course, one of the things COVID has done has messed up global supply chains right and left so that we now realize just how foolish it was to render ourselves gratuitously that vulnerable, right, to other places to supply the goods and services that we need instead of doing it ourselves as we used to do. We're sort of figuring that out now. But for some reason, even though most of the country is kind of beginning to figure that out now, Larry Summers has it noticed, Jason Furman has it noticed, and all of these other sort of neo Milton Friedmanite types who keep saying, Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, apparently haven't noticed either. But everybody in this room, in this sort of virtual room, presumably kind of has noticed. And that's sort of why we're here. And Alfeca uh, and the NIB proposal essentially amounts to a really fundamental, critical early step in effectively basically untying those arms and legs, loosening them up, getting the blood flowing again, and turning this country back into what it once promised to be, and once in some ways was a production marvel, a productive marvel. And the great thing is that this time we can do it a lot better than we did it before, because in the past, the last time we were a productive marvel was before the great civil rights revolution, right? So the productive marvel operated mainly to the benefit of white males and women were largely excluded and people of color were largely excluded. If we do it this time, where we're recognizing that every single one of us, male and female, every racial background, every ethnic background, every 
back, every cultural background is every individual, no matter what their background is a miracle and is a creative and productive miracle. If we recognize our fellow citizens as each one of them being a productive miracle, a creative miracle, imagine the things that we'll be able to do. And imagine how bloody embarrassed we'll be that for 50 years in a kind of Babylonian captivity, we were saying, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon and so all the only thing we can do to get those prices back down is to tell a bunch of people who have jobs now sorry we're gonna have to throw you out of your jobs and you're gonna have to lie around and panhandle and beg or something just so we can get those prices down without interfering with the profitability of record profit drawing firms i don't think that's a good idea i think it's much better to wake up again and untie ourselves unbind ourselves and essentially the NIB proposal and um, Bill 339 is a really critical first step, I think, in getting that done. And with that, I'll sort of stop for the time being. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Professor Hockett. I would just like to uh, really thank you for the entertaining way that you present these concepts. And I'm just wondering, are your classes oversubscribed there at Cornell or is it, is it possible for people to actually get in and, and listen to you on a semester basis? We have a lot of fun um, and we have the, we use the, lar uh, it does seem to be the case thus far, at least that we have the largest, we use the largest classrooms, the biggest auditorium. Oh, it's Thank great you. fun. It's, it's just well, a, a delight every day. The students are a joy. You have a great way of illustrating those concepts. So thanks yeah. again. Um, next, I would like to go to another one of our great speakers. Um, Ellen Brown is, is an author and chairman of the Public Banking Institute, and she's recently had an article uh, published, a new article um, uh, that's been picked up by multiple online media uh, organizations and is getting a lot of play around the country. Uh, Ellen, can you tell us about your article and, and uh, tell us about um, uh, public banking and your institute? Okay, yeah, well, I did a PowerPoint. I'm really not a great speaker, like you say. And I too wish I'd had Bob for my professor in law school. I would have would have been great. Uh, as Hofecker points out, we've had two major infrastructure bills in the last year, 2020, the 2021 bipartisan infrastructure law, but it was mostly about highways and bridges and roads and the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, which was mostly about energy security and climate change. So we're still short, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, more than 2 trillion, but it looked like Elfeca had it up to about 5 trillion for really critical things like water. You can't get much, much more critical than that. Affordable housing, high-speed rail, power, tran uh, power transmission lines. Um, so Congress has pretty much reached the end of their appropriations for infrastructure for this election cycle. So what we need is a workaround, something that doesn't require Congress to promise us $5 trillion. And uh, Roosevelt faced the same problem, um, he and his government. So in the 1930s, what they did was they used a publicly owned financial institution. It wasn't actually a bank, it was the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And that's where they got their off budget financing. So this is a quote from Jane, James Butkowitz, who is professor of economics at the University of Delaware, explaining how useful this tool was. The RFC was an executive agency with the ability to obtain funding through the treasury outside of the normal legislative process. Thus the RFC could be used to finance a variety of favored projects and programs without obtaining legislative approval. RFC lending did not count toward budgetary expenditures. So the expansion of the role and influence of the government through the RFC was not reflected in the federal budget. Uh, so it funded many things. There's a, this is a map of one of many agencies that funded was the uh, Public Works Administration, which had projects all over the country, as you can see in this map. So the RFC started with a modest $500 million in capitalization, and it issued bonds, mostly bought by the Treasury. And with that modest start, it wound up lending or investing over $40 billion over 25 years, including funding all the all the uh, development or the infrastructure of the New Deal and World War II. And for all that, it turned a profit to the government, which has made money on the deal. Not only didn't spend money, but actually made money. And it was not um, inflationary. As you can see from this chart, 
that we didn't really have inflation going up until the 1960s. And why was that? As uh, uh, Bob points out, it was because the loans were for productive purposes. They were producing things. So you had supply and demand going up together. Prices remained stable. Um, many, the majority of these loans were to state and local governments. They also made loans to farms and other um, industries. But uh, many of these states and these states and local governments tended to also be uh, bankrupt or close to bankrupt. Anyway, they'd hit their debt limits for general obligation bonds, which those are the bonds that they put to the taxpayers for a vote and you wind up paying money for taxes on them. So what they did for a workaround was they used revenue bonds. So the loans would be paid out of what the uh, the projects or what the funding produced. So and it was another reason why they had to be productive loans because they needed to pay back the things. And we could do that again today, of course. Um, but if we're, we're talking about a bank, which actually has more potential than even than the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, for one thing, a bank can leverage its capital. So uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was basically just a revolving fund. They had a certain amount of money and they lent it out, waited for it to come back and lent it again. But a bank if, can, has a certain amount of its own money, which is capital. It, assuming a 10% um, capital requirement, it can lend out 10 times what it has in the way of capital. And of course, when the borrowers pull the money out of the bank, it has to cover that in some way, but it also has access to cheap liquidity. Um, ideally, the depositors, uh, and we know that deposits aren't paying very much in the way of interest right now, so that's a very cheap way to get, get your liquidity, or they can borrow from the other banks at the Fed funds rate, or they can borrow directly from the Fed at its, um, at its discount window. Or if that's not enough, it, the bank could also issue bonds as the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did. Um, in fact, I said 90% of the money supply is, uh, is, from, is created by banks, but I've or it said 90, I, I've heard 95% if you talk about the money that's just in the United States circulating, because much of it is uh, overseas. 95% is created by banks. Our money, our money is backed by nothing but the full faith and credit of the people, meaning we the people are willing to accept it. So we obviously should be, should be owning the banks, creating this money, or at least some of the banks. And uh, the National Infrastructure Bank as a federal, a big federal public bank would be a great start. Thank you very much. Ellen, can you briefly mention your article and um, tell us what your article was about, where our viewers could find your article and maybe where what kind of distribution it's getting? I did talk about China and how the Chinese also are funding that they've got three big policy banks, which are in effect infrastructure banks. And through those banks, they are funding, they've been funding development for the last 30 years, and they're obviously running circles around us. And they've um, managed to reroute their water with these very large water projects, among other things. They are, clearly, they have high-speed rail <laughs> crisscrossing all over the country. And they're doing it with these policy banks, which issue bonds. And the bonds apparently are in high demand. Or they could borrow directly, or they could get their money directly from the, the Public Bank of China, which is the Central Bank of China. And um, it's, I couldn't nail down exactly how they do that, but you, one would assume that the Central Bank of China probably just prints the money and lends it directly or gives it directly to, for these projects. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Appreciate it. And so your article can be found online at Common Dreams, and I would really encourage our viewers to, uh, to check it out and give that article a read. Um, next, um, I would like to uh, go to the great state of New Mexico and uh, where Senator Bill Tallman has been one of the, our stalwart supporters of the National Infrastructure Bank. He's led the, uh, the charge there uh, to support it. And I think he's got two of their three Congress people on board as co-sponsors at this point. Uh, he was not able to be here this evening, but um, I'm honored to be able to present a few comments that came from Senator Tallman. 
So he would like everyone to know that the Rio Grande River actually ran dry for a 100 mile stretch this summer for the first time in 40 years. Uh, the state of New Mexico state engineer resigned because New Mexico is only going to receive from the infrastructure bill one sixth or 350 million of the 2 billion that is needed for water infrastructure there in New Mexico. New Mexico has experienced three consecutive years of extreme drought where 73% of New Mexico is classified as under extreme or severe drought. Agricultural water is being rationed in a large portion of the state. So if you are noticing your grocery prices going up at the store, it could be because our farmers across the West are being impacted by the lack of water. A very weak snowpack from the mountains in Colorado and New Mexico has contributed uh, to the drought. Uh, New Mexico's largest lake is one half full compared to just several months ago. And um, we have an op-ed that has been printed in uh, the two largest newspapers in uh, New Mexico. That would be the Albuquerque Journal, as you see here, and the Santa Fe New Mexican. And so if there um, is uh, media um, in New Mexico, these are the two places where um, readers are going to catch up on the news. And so we really thank Senator Tallman for getting that op-ed inserted in those two important uh, newspapers. Uh, you know, drought, of course, is not just a New Mexico issue, it's across the West. And our, some of our additional speakers will be ad addressing uh, water issues that we are experiencing across the country. Um, our next speaker um, has also um, been doing a great job for the National Infrastructure Bank. Senator Robert Hasegawa from Washington State uh, recently um, was instrumental in getting a resolution um, uh, discussed and brought up at the, um, was it the conference of, uh, conference of state legislators or the other one? But oh, Senator Hasegawa, you can tell us which one it was that, um, where you led the charge. I guess I'll just sort of throw it out there. I'm a union worker, and uh, that's the lens that I view this whole struggle uh, through. Uh, my history is I come out of the Teamsters Union, uh, was an organizer for a lot of years, uh, actually was the head of the largest Teamsters trucking local union here in the Pacific Northwest. And during that time, uh, we put all of our new members, every initiate that signed up with the with the union through a training. And a component of that training was about popular economics and viewing economics and economic theory through a worker's lens, not a privileged um, top tier. I don't know how you describe, I, I will eat. Is there a polite way to describe the 0.1%? At any rate, um, we determine that economics is more an art as, as opposed to a science and art is in the eye of the beholder. And if you're the one who controls all the power and the strings, you're gonna to want to apply economics and sell economics um, from that perspective. Well, we tried to teach economics to our members through a worker's lens and uh, all, all respects to uh, Professor Hockett. I, I loved your, your presentation, by the way, and others like uh, Professor Reich out at uh, UC Berkeley. But um, it, it really boils down to class politics. And you know, you got people who are poo pooing what is the solution is right in front of their face. We know it works. Uh, there's proven model that all we have to do is run it through a copy machine and do it again. And yet uh, here in Washington State, for instance, we've the biggest problem I've been fighting for a, a publicly owned state bank here in the state of Washington for a lot of years. Um, we've had treasurers, state treasurers who are both Republican and Democrat. Previous Democratic treasurer was a prof economics professor at the University of Washington. Could not convince him that public banking was a real solution. Uh, 
it just goes to show that it's the lens that you perceive these things through. So what's the best way to avoid a recession? It's been shown, make, create jobs, but the, when we're creating jobs in this form through a national infrastructure bank, you're killing two birds with one stone. The best way to get, avoid or get out of a recession is to create jobs, right? That's why our economy was so uh, vi vital uh, during those years, even uh, the post-World uh, War II years. You know, there was a lot of other factors too, but uh, the, the point is that when we create jobs through the National Infrastructure Bank, we're actually killing two birds with one stone because we're building things that will benefit future economic growth and development and just every all boats rise with the tide. And the fact that this is so difficult to convince Volga, well, some of it is the economics that we've been taught and the monetary policies we've been taught uh, from the so-called master economics there in uh, Wall Street is that um, they don't want us to know that all money is not what you see in your wallet. It is not paper. So when you say this will create no new debt and it won't raise any taxes, they think it's hocus pocus hooey uh, because that's not the lives that we've lived in. Right, we, we know what money is. You, you gotta go to work and earn it and you get some paper and you spend it. But 95% of the money that is out there is not printed. How do we convince our um, neighbors that this is a real legitimate, it, it's a proven solution, which should be a no brainer for us to adopt. And I, I've spoken with my uh, congressional representatives uh, around here. Um, and I don't know if they're just doing a political dance or uh, what, what the stall is. They, they, there are any number of excuses why they're going to continue to think about it. Well, OK, continue to think about it. But damn it, just sign on first and then continue to think about it because this is the solution. So um, at any rate, uh, we've been working hard. We, uh, I, I heard that the Council of State Governments East, which is, if, if you don't know what the Council of State Governments is, it's a national organization. There's, there's two of these types of things. There's the National Conference of State Legislatures, NCSL, which is called, that is an, sort of an umbrella organization of all legislatures around the country. There's another organization called CSG, Council of State Governments, which is similar, uh, but they break down into regions, the East, West, Central, and South. And the East just passed a resolution supporting the National Infrastructure Bank in the form of uh, HR 3339. I tried to get something like that passed in Council of State Governments West. We came, they actually declared it passed at first. <laughs> And then somebody raised a point of order and it turns out that the two thirds vote required to endorse it fell short by one vote. They rounded it down instead of up. Uh, and we would have passed it had a couple of my colleagues decided, not decided to go to lunch or do other things at, <laughs> at that meeting at any rate. Uh, so uh, there is a national movement, a growing awareness um, and we're counting on all of you to help win this battle for working people all around the country. And so my ask of all of you is to please talk with your congressional delegation, whoever is representing you or your members, if you're union leaders or your colleagues or whatever, please just ask them to uh, take a look at HR 3339 and uh, please sign on to it. And if you need um, folks to go with you into those meetings who can provide more expert testimony, uh, you should call Alfec. <laughs> I'm volunteering you, Alfec, uh, or Ellen, or Walt uh, McCree, or uh, Professor Hockett, or whoever, you know, 
We just need signatures on this bill to show that it is a real thing, that there is growing support for it so that we can carry it on into the next congressional session. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Senator Hasegawa. That was great. Um, and I do want to uh, point out that um, it's not enough to just mention this idea, this concept to people once. Um, it, it needs to be mentioned two or three or four or five times for it to really sink in uh, how great this concept is. But I'm sure if you're out talking to your friends and colleagues, many of them uh, have no idea what the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did, or they may have no idea that China has financed all that high-speed rail with infrastructure banks. And so we just need to keep contacting our local legislators as well as our members of Congress. Um, okay, uh, next we want to go to Mississippi. Uh, we were going to have Representative Tracy Rosebud here. However, he's facing a little crisis there in um, his area of uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And, but we do have Representative Hester Jackson McCray on who's agreed to um, maybe give us a couple minutes and kind of tell us about uh, what's happening there with uh, the water supply in uh, Jackson. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, Mike, I was telling them all I know that the water is bad, but you know, um, Jackson's water crisis is nothing new to the state of Mississippi. It has been going on for over 40 years. Um, uh, you have to know the history of the Jim Crow era to understand why in 2022, there's a water crisis in the capital. Uh, up until 1971, there had been continual departure of white citizens from the city of Jackson because of the integration, integration of the school system. And the white citizens decided to go to the outliners areas so that the kids wouldn't go to school with the uh, black children. Um, I got a little notes, you know, so, I, so you can kind of get a history of what's going on. So because what they call white flight, they neglected the city of Jackson, uh, the state of Jackson, um, knowing that the capital continued to need improvement. Uh, they just neglected it. Um, uh, Jackson is 70, 80% uh, black. Um, the power that be in the, in the state legislation ignored requests from the city government for assistance, even though it's the state capital. And I really think it's a shame that they ignored that being the state capital. It will seem like you want the state capital to be the best place in the state of Mississippi. And now you guys are becoming the worst. And it should have been taken care a long time ago and not just patching up stuff and, and, and whatever they do. Now I've just I've been going to Jackson for the uh, past three years, and I have seen so much decline. You know, every time I go there, uh, you know, I stay at the hotels. Or, well, Miss Hester, we on the water boat. Uh, you're gonna have to uh, brush your teeth with bottled water, you know, and all this stuff. So um, maybe this tragedy had to happen in order for them to pay some more attention and take it seriously that Jackson has a water problem. Thank you guys. I have a quick comment. This is Stephen Fry. Okay, go ahead. Um, I, uh, and thank you, Ms. Hester for your comments. Um, I have had indirect dealings uh, in that uh, central Mississippi area over uh, the last 37 years in my work. I'm retired now. And uh, I also have some uh, personal acquaintances in that area. And one of the first things I did when this uh, Jackson, Mississippi uh, issue with the water supply system was I uh, very easily uh, went in and looked at the other water supply systems in the surrounding counties. And to your point, ma'am, uh, there are no issues with their water supply systems. I think that's all good for us to understand and to know that that does correlate with exactly what is being said, that uh, 
the area is not being funded by the rest of the state and that central state capital is not being paid attention to. And uh, I offer back to the forum. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you for those comments. Um, what we're going to do is uh, quickly move on uh, so we can get through the rest of our speakers. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Assemblyman Felix Ortiz, the former assistant speaker of the New York Assembly from Albany, New York. Assemblyman. Uh, I'm here. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be with all of you tonight. I just I would like to, uh, to address a couple of points very quick, and I'm very proud. I'm very happy about the work that has been performed by the, by the organization and those who have played a major role on really dedicating on calling on Congress. Right now, we have about 17 sponsors in Congress. Uh, I, I hope the number is not wrong, uh, but I keep in track by reading the emails, uh, getting Bob Barr from more emails these days uh, than before, but this is a great thing. Uh, I hope people will read them as well um, to get a sense of direction where we stand, especially when Alberta sent those uh, emails regarding their own newsletters about the inflation versus what happened with comment that has been made by other people versus what is reality in a happening in our real life. Uh, it make a very different, uh, a very different uh, direction and help me to also articulate to talk to other people as well. I also would like just for point of reference, uh, I would like to go back to Bob about the National Conference State Legislator, which uh, I served there for 26 years when I was in the legislature. I also served 12 years, uh, my last 12 years in the executive committee and chair a bunch of committees. Uh, uh, one of the things that need to be highlighted, and I hope that Bob can probably look into this. I'm no longer elected, uh, but uh, so, uh, the NCSL do have what they call a labor council. Uh, the labor council be, that belong to NCSL uh, is a group of labor members, labor union members, that they come together during uh, NCSL meeting, uh, not so much about CSG, Council State Government, but NCSL. And that will be another mechanism to have uh, uh, the labor movement uh, to really to talk to a state legislator, or Senate Assembly throughout the country. Uh, and for you, Bob, to probably uh, you know, have a meeting with them and one of the meetings of NCSL, call a meeting and, and invite members and have uh, these folks uh, that attend the labor roundtable discussion uh, to uh, also do a, re a outreach a state by state. I was very fortunate to be one of the co-founders of that group. Uh, so that's the reason I, I know about the, the, the organization and they when they want to be effective, uh, I remember working on some issues with them uh, regarding, for example, uh, Monsanto and, uh, and trying to get more uh, uh, organics items and taking pesticide out of the farms. Uh, that was very influential. You know, uh, also, also it's important to keep in mind that uh, when you talk to NCSL, it's a group of folks that fundamentally uh, depend on raising money from corporate America. <laughs> so, so, you, so it's a combination uh, which is a very, a very interesting dynamic. If you depend on the foundations of money, so you have to understand that they will reach out to whoever give money in Walmart, Monsanto, and so on and so far. Uh, the, big, the big brothers and big sister of uh, the Petroleum Association and fossil fuel. So they will do that. Uh, secondly, uh, I would like also to take a quick point uh, Dr. Brown, who she was talking about um, China. Well, China right now, uh, they have created a new multilateral uh, investment banking uh, in, uh, to deal with infrastructure. So when Dr. Brown was talking about uh, all the projects that is been taking place in China, I would, uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I've been a witness of that evolution because uh, I have been blessed and to manage to travel to China since 1996 until the pandemic. So I will go to China almost twice or three times a year uh, with delegations and we will visit at different places. Like I'll give you a quick example, Xamen uh, is a providence that uh, was completely, uh, con the, the water, the river, the lake was completely contaminated. You cannot drink the water there. Uh, 
to working together with NGOs uh, around the globe and the WHO, uh, we managed to come out with, uh, well, we managed to convince or have China convince themselves, the government, uh, to ensure that we, we was doing the right thing by cleaning the water. And three years later, I would say to you this, I witnessed this, that not only they cleaned that water, but they built exactly what Dr. Brown was talking about, a, a, a train infrastructure that connected five different providence because they believe fundamentally on something that uh, Bob was talking about, about job creation. But not only they believe on job creation, you know, it's a competition. They, they, lo they love to, they, they, to compete in the market. And whatever people was coming from Fuzhou or Canton to go to Xiamen, uh, the people of Congress of China, you know, the government itself, would like those people not to stay in Xiamen, but to go back to where they came from. So how easy it is to have a, a railroad bill, uh, especially the, the 200 or three, 500 mile per hour, the speed train that will take them back in one, in one day. Now, believe it or not, some of the infrastructure and construction are literally took place in less than 30 months. And, uh, and if some of you remember the 2008 Olympic, uh, they used a total of three, to five million people to build those Olympic in 12 months. And I was, again, I was at the Olympics and I was before they was building, when the Olympic happened and after uh, the Olympic got uh, the finish. So, so what I say this to justify and to support what Bob and Dr. Brown was talking about. And he said, article that I will, I, I did send it to a steward just a few minutes ago uh, because it's, important, it's, it's interesting and is fundamentally we need to know that was a report done by the Congressional Research Center in Washington DC about exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, 20, 2013, they come together. I mentioned this in the last uh, conversation I, I was with you guys that uh, when Biden went to the GS7, the Biden came with a great approach to do something together with the, uh, 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 Europe, but at the same token, China was taking already the approach to do it a multilateral uh, investment bank. And that is how, and that is how China, uh, on the footnote, China uh, helped to build an amusement park that cost $1.2 billion in El Salvador, in San Salvador, just the other day. Three days ago, they just opened it and was landfill. So, and, and the president of San Salvador say, oh, we're working with China to clean our airs as well, but, without, but they are not getting paid for the work they're doing here. And I, in my mind, I said, knowing the Chinese government, I said, well, wait when they knock your door and they take your seat away from you and you don't want to find out that you don't have it being a country anymore. But they are doing this literally helping uh, another quick example is Tanzania. Uh, we did a humanitarian effort in Tanzania. Uh, we, I was involved with that. Uh, clean water was a project. And China was already in Tanzania helping to build the roads and to connect Tanzania with the other side of Tanzania to make sure people can have mobility. So, so I think uh, our people of Congress, either uh, they drinking the wrong coffee or oh, maybe the wrong tequila, or uh, maybe we might have to send some Bacardi in their way. Uh, but uh, battle line here is that uh, I will reintegrate that uh, I know we, 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 we're trying to do the best we can to reach out. I know we have a state legislator who has managed to be part of this crusade, but I think enough is enough uh, by giving the opportunity to these Congress people to get reelected by doing nothing and by thinking that we should be pleased by the little thing that they're doing, when in reality, there is a bigger picture here. And I finish with, with this, uh, by not only creating jobs, but sustainability, affordable housing. You know, where Representative Jackson was talking about uh, Mississippi and the water, you know, I happened to be there not too long ago and, uh, and talked to some of the legislators that are still, you know, we're still connected to each other. Uh, and, and, and the other big issue that I have to continue to be hammered is that this bill, 
as skeptical that sound, uh, will not increase taxes. And this is something that made Congress and Chuck Schumer uh, run away from this because they want to make sure that they can continue to feed the big corporation, the big, the big, uh, big guys and big boys. And to, in that way, it's an exchange for them to continue to raise money for the National uh, U.S. Senate Democratic Committee, the same thing about Pelosi. So, you know, the battle line here is we have a lot of work to do. And, and I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, like a steward would say to me all the time, uh, we need your money. We, don't, we cannot get money from private. Uh, and I, whatever you can afford, give to us. So whatever five money, five dollar we have, we should begin to help the organization to do the same thing. And because we need to put our face, our presence, our face in Congress, we need to have meeting personally, one to one. If we cannot get it on their district because they're running away from us, we're going to go to you, because that's the only way. When they begin to see this troop coming in and be serious about that we are not gonna to tolerate this anymore. And we have 10 state different legislators coming with the group that we have here. And some of the experts, as Alberta, Dr. Brown and others uh, that can articulate this. So we can have a group at least of two or three people walking in through those rooms. Because let's say, for example, you take Representative Jackson, she might know her congressperson. We can walk in and try to convince it. But you know she cannot do it just by herself. She needs support. She did all the faces, all the people. And uh, when she walk in, we supporting her, giving her the leadership that she deserves and the support that she deserves in order to knock that door and for that Congress person to say, wow, where these people came from? Well, Alberta is from Virginia, Felix is from Puerto Rico, you can make that up. Uh, and then, uh, uh, then we have uh, Bob from uh, Washington State. So, you know, you, you have a cross section of people from different states. And this is something that Believe it or not, I used it when I was creating the National Hispanic Caucus and was very effective. So that is my two cents, although I say I will finish. That was my final thought. But uh, I think I would like to say again, you guys are doing a wonderful job. Let's continue hammer it. And I know we are not gonna give up until we get to the finish line. Thank you, my God bless you and good night. Thank you, Felix. I think that was about 50 cents worth though, not, not 10 cents. Um, any rate, um, Thank you for those comments. I think it's really, really important that we look at China as an example of what can be accomplished with um, uh, infrastructure banks. And certainly um, all of our members of Congress should be very concerned about uh, the loss of manufacturing. It makes our country less secure. And um, we, we need to keep pushing um, our members of Congress and our local legislators. Okay, um, we're gonna go on. Um, our next speaker is an academic and PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania. He has a, a real world example of what a uh, national infrastructure bank uh, might finance the type of project. Jay? Thank you, Julie. Um, thank you, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm coming from the Keystone State, Pennsylvania, here in Philadelphia, and um, we're in a bit of a situation here. So I'll start from the beginning. In 1913, um, the city of Philadelphia makes the decision to build an elevated subway up Roosevelt Boulevard. Roosevelt Boulevard is about 10, 10 miles long. It is 300 feet wide which is huge. Uh, it is mostly tree lined, so it, it, it has its aesthetic beauty, um, but unfortunately it also has 12 lanes of traffic. Uh, this includes local and express lanes. And because of this and the lack of, of building, thank you, uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, because of this, Roosevelt Boulevard itself is um, in Northeast, Philadelphia, but there's no real um, rapid transit subway connection in this part of Philadelphia. And there is between 400,000 and 500,000 people living in Northeast Philadelphia. And we know that um, because of the numerous times that Philadelphia has studied building a subway in this corridor, how important it is. You know, they tried in 1913, tried again in the 40s, tried again in the 60s, um, tried, tried again in the 80s, and then tried, the last time they tried was between 1999 and uh, 2003. You can go to the next slide. 
So like I said before, some of the conditions, you know, 300 uh, feet wide, um, you have express lanes and local lanes, and it is considered uh, one of the most dangerous roads in America. Um, in Philadelphia, Roosevelt Boulevard has a nickname, um, the Boulevard of Death, because of the amount of people that are hit by car traffic. In fact, the woman was uh, fatally hit about a week and a half ago. It was a tragedy. Um, and also, uh, the boulevard has a very low transit quality. Buses get stuck in traffic. Um, it takes a long time to get from anywhere northeast. And if you're trying to get to Center City, which is the center of this, um, this region from northeast, it's going to take you some time. So it, it, it's a major problem. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. So of course, you know, 1913, the plan for an elevated subway. Um, 1960s, they had a plan to build an expressway where the subway would be in the center of the expressway, similar to some of the rapid transit lines in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and that too was defeated by community opposition um, and because uh, the line was a bit over budget. Um, ultimately, it was never built. And, but the last time that they studied it was a 1999 to 2003 study, which I'm gonna talk to you more about now. Next slide, please. So between, um, from the 1999 to 2003 uh, study of the corridor, a locally planned alternative, alternative C here, is a heavy rail subway that would have been built in phases and would have been completed by 2018. Sadly, by 20, uh, 2008, um, the local, uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization and the transit agency here, SEPTA, uh, decided to go in a different direction. They didn't think that they could get funding for a project this 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 large this would be considered in a sense a mega project this is 12 to 14 miles of subway and elevated sub on uh, uh subways an elevated train um you know 12 new stations um and this would have been so impactful it would, would have diverted nearly 83,000 cars off the road and would have had a daily ridership of nearly 124,500 riders a day, which is, it would have been, um, if built at the time, it, it would have been, uh, had the highest daily ridership of any proposed subway in the country. But it, it was never completed. And a large part is not due to community opposition, but because of funding. You know, sadly, the city of Philadelphia and the state of Pennsylvania cannot afford the subway. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you're embarrassed to say, but admitting is the first step that we need something different to, to break this cycle of not being able to get this critical transit link built. There has to be a change. You can go to the next slide. Sorry, that's the last slide I have. Oh, okay. Well, um, what I'll, what I'll say is this, um, we are working to move this project forward. We believe that a project of this magnitude can create thousands, thousands of jobs and induce transit oriented development, which will house, house, um, thousands of Philadelphians in a time when we have a national housing crisis. The time is now we, we truly do believe that you know, the National Infrastructure Bank will be able to get projects as important as the Roosevelt Boulevard subway shovel ready. We need to get put people to work. We have the capability. We have the manpower. We just need the funding. Let's get the National Infrastructure Bank up and running and let's put millions of Americans to work. Thank you. Thanks, Jay, for that great presentation. I do believe that there are many projects similar to this around the country that may not be quite shovel ready, but, but, they're, but they're down the road and they're um, possible projects that a national infrastructure bank would be interested in helping with. So now we're gonna go to um, our cleanup uh, batter.
and that would be Walt McRae, who is the chair emeritus of the Public Banking Institute, also from Pennsylvania. Walt? What a really remarkable uh, evening of sharing that has uh, come forward here. I, um, my, my job here is briefly uh, to talk about two things. Uh, one is about money, <laughs> uh, and uh, the other is about will and uh, public uh, private uh, PPPs, public private platforms. Um, in the conversations this time, we've seen a, a two things have been coming up that we need. One is money, and the other is water. And so, uh, as mentioned, I'm uh, from a part of Pennsylvania uh, where a, some news has come out about infrastructure and water this week, some rather encouraging news. And it kind of brings a couple of our, the points that I'd like to raise uh, together. Um, first of all, about money. Uh, the NIB and Alfeca and company have done a great job in just distilling uh, what uh, is now being used as the go-to methodology for funding projects like this, uh, since the budgets of cities and states don't are not qualified or don't have enough uh, to, to build the projects like Jay was just talking about and, and so many others. Um, and so they go to pu PPPs, public-private partnerships. But when you look at them, it's really a misnomer. It should be private profit platforms because that's, that's really the way that's organized. Now, PPPs have a, a long list of expensive accomplishments and not, a few, not just a few uh, unfortunate stories and outcomes. But since the 70s, uh, they have been the go-to financing source for governments to compensate for this lack of, of money. Uh, so what they do basically is they bring in private dollars to be able to uh, make, make more dollars on the investments uh, that belong to the public, on public asset improvements and so forth. Um, back in, uh, well, I guess about 10, 12 years ago, Dr. Magritte Kennedy, uh, a German, uh, actually uh, an architect and economist, studied the impact of interest on the economy and on the costs of what in interest debt financing is. And it turns out that about 40% of everything that we buy uh, is attributable to the cost of financing, of the interest that has gone into making the product and so forth and so on. Um, in the public banking industry, we like industry institute, we like to talk about the example of the uh, uh, Oakland Bay Bridge uh, that cost in terms of uh, design and materials and workmanship six billion dollars to build but the public is getting billed for 12 billion dollars because of the financing so that because we do not as a governmental uh, uh, as you know people who own a government we're a democracy right because we don't have our own financing mechanisms our own banks we have to go to the private markets to the bond markets to private equity etc cetera, etc cetera, and they pour on uh, the uh, the costs to the public, which of course is feeding that um, that elite group of uh, of uh, uh, financialists uh, that uh, that Bernie likes to mention, Bernie Sanders likes to mention, and say, look, there there are three people that now control uh, own more than the the bottom half of of our country, over 160 million people, their wealth is equivalent to three people, so. Part of what I've been hearing tonight is an urgency and an, a, a frustration with why we, the people, are not able to get what we want. I mean, this is our place, and what is money? Money is our full faith in is our full faith in credit. It's not the stuff in the bank. It's I mean, it's not it's not the you know the, the dollar bills. It's the fact that we will stand behind our uh, our the credit that we extend, uh, and uh, banks do that. That's why we need the National Infrastructure Bank, not a revolving fund, but a bank to be able to, uh, to leverage our equity and our assets. Now, I, you know, I was looking at Jay's picture of Philadelphia. As I was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm just outside of Philadelphia in Bucks County. <laughs> you look at the, the city of Philadelphia is what, number six in the country, and you think of all of the assets and you think, what? You don't have enough money to build a road to look after the people? You know, why is that? And I think the reason is pretty obvious, because we don't control the money. Now, all right, so money, water, infrastructure, uh, we, we are at a point. Uh, Jay says the time is now. I think the time is past, and there's a certain amount of uh, resentment 
and, uh, and, and that is being built up in the populace. And I think we all realize that this is a very critical year to try to get the people's power back in place. All right. <laughs> I'll tell you a little story, and I, 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 first of all, let me just mention some things that we don't like about PPPs, okay? Uh, this is the MIB, this is Alpheca's list. Uh, the, because the, the need for private investors to earn a return, okay, that's upwards of seven to 10%. That's actually more than borrowing typically from the bond market, which is how governments normally finance their infrastructure. Then there's the tendency for for-profit companies to maximize their revenue, which is a conflict of interest, uh, especially as the public services that they provide when they take over water and sewer authorities or, uh, or airports or parking meters or whatever, uh, they, they have kind of a natural monopoly uh, on those services. Um, getting around this monopoly price gouging rules is something that, uh, that privatized utilities are able to do as well. So, and then of course the long contract lengths don't work very well because the private provider is inept, or if, if they're uh, inept or corrupt, uh, it's tough for the governments to get the assets back. Uh, the limitations on the degree to which the risks for delays and cost overruns can actually be transferred from the government to uh, P3 concessionaires. In other words, the private parties don't really want to deal with the contingencies of having to build the project. Uh, and non-compete clauses uh, also a factor in there that would siphon off revenues from, uh, you know, that uh, they can't make improvements uh, over privately controlled projects that would otherwise be needed. So, and also there's a, a frequently a lack of technical capacity uh, by public officials to formulate, formulate and manage sufficient oversight. Okay, that's a brief look at what PPPs uh, are about uh, or how they operate and why we don't want to deal with them and we should stay clear of them. So my story. Bucks County is, as I say, outside of Philadelphia. It also happens to be the home of where George Washington uh, and his buddies uh, crossed the river to uh, surprise the Hessians and the British in, 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 uh, in Trenton back in 1774. Um, in 1981, a bunch of us uh, locals uh, were upset about a water issue. The powers that be, the development powers, the Philadelphia Electric Company and, the, and a, host, a host of other interests wanted to build a water project along the Delaware River. And uh, it upset the locals because we knew it was going to be a, a major impact on our area. So the, the locals got together and over years, and including a lot of dramatic theatrics uh, where we had, you know, my little town has got about 600 people in it. We had 500 people in the town arrested on a January 6th at 6 a.m. because the people stood up and said, we're not gonna take it anymore, okay? Uh, Abby Hoffman got involved during that time. It was really quite, uh, quite an interesting example of the sort of thing that I think that uh, Mr. Ortiz was talking about where we just have to stand up and move this thing forward. Now, in Bucks County this past week, a PPP uh, success story uh, was realized when the citizens of Bucks County turned down a check for $1.1 billion to take over and control the Bucks County Water and Sewer Authority. It was inspiring to see people show up on the street and convince the county commissioners and ultimately the water authority that they weren't gonna get away with it. They didn't wanna have their, uh, lose their public asset uh, to a private party that would be looking to make uh, profits uh, 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 on an item uh, off of their, uh, uh, their uh, water and sewer bills. So it can be done uh, and we need to be doing more of it. Uh, water and money are very similar in the economic matrix. Uh, you know, money is the water that lubricates uh, the cur our, like currency, lubricates our ability to do work together. We have to own that because if, obviously, if our if our representatives aren't going to take action, the people are going to have to make it impossible for them to not take action. And that's all I would leave you with tonight. Let's stay on this. Let's get our representatives signed up. Let's show up in D.C. if we need to. Uh, it's this is our project to do. Uh, it's here. Um, and you're there. Take part, do what you can. Make it happen.
Hey, thank you so much, Walt. That was great. Um, I, I think there was uh, one of the recent James Bond movies was about control of the water supply, wasn't it? I mean, that's going into the future. Water is going to be more important than ever. Anyway, okay, now we're coming to one of my most uh, favored parts of the program, the question and answer. So we'll um, be able to entertain questions from folks. And um, if we don't get enough questions, and I may be calling on some of our other learned folks on the phone, how about Scott Coons from Florida? Yes, good evening, everyone. Hello, Julie. Hi there. Uh, Scott Coons from Gainesville, Florida. I have the privilege of serving as the executive director of the North Central Florida Regional Planning Council, which is a 14 county regional development organization. And I also had the opportunity to serve uh, a year or so ago as the president of the National Association of Development Organization, representing over 500 similar regional development entities made up of local elected officials and business leaders from across the country. And we, our board of directors, reviewed the National Infrastructure Bank proposal and House Bill 3339. And I'm pleased to say that board uh, passed a resolution uh, last year at our annual conference to endorse uh, the creation of the National Infrastructure Bank because it's critical to economic development. You can't have job creation, uh, as Dr. Hockett mentioned earlier, without being able to have infrastructure and a manufacturing base. So very pleased with the robust conversation we had this evening and uh, look forward to continuing to advance this initiative uh, at the national level. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, we've been working very hard to spread the word around the country. So many of your local officials in your town may have heard about the Infrastructure Bank. Um, next, I'd like to go to Joan Stollard, who has her hand up and you're muted, Joan. Thank you. Um, I'm Ms. Joan Stallard in DC, and this is an issue I've been watching a, a long time. And I hear tonight, Many people talking about uh, contact your local representative, congressman, of course, D.C. has Eleanor, non-voting rep, Eleanor Norton. But um, I'm, I work with a lot of groups and um, similar problems in each one is, how, you know, how do you get your legislation passed? And what the most effective groups are doing are like uh, Progressive Democrats of America, and that is, um, you know, they have already set up people in each state and in many districts uh, who regularly talk with the staff of the Congress people. And they're doing it by Zoom calls uh, in many cases. You know, if they happen to be in your, in your territory or you know, for home on recess. But the staff expects a you know, professional approach uh, you know, to doing Zoom calls. And they'll give you, you know, I just wondered if we had a group uh, that was prepared, uh, you, you know, to, uh, you know, bring three or four friends from maybe different organizations or just the constituents to, uh, to, to get to know the staff of each congressperson. I mean, is this a plan or can we begin to form a plan like that? Because it's not the kind of thing that most people, uh, perhaps different people, that most people do automatically. I mean, people are afraid they're, it, you know, it's just like a bit over their heads. But if a right. team trains you, it's, uh, sure. or they have for each group that you have somebody maybe from this call, you know, like Ellen or our uh, Cornell professor ready to go on the Zoom call, you can sure. do it. Thank, thank you, Joan. Um, what I think we'll do is have Elfeka briefly address that. Um, but we've been doing Zoom <laughs> meetings um, around the country for quite some time. Elfeka, briefly. Uh, comments on how we would help uh, local groups? Your idea, Joan, is absolutely correct. And this is the thing that absolutely works. And we have been doing it for the last couple of years. Um, we have uh, increased our network all across the country uh, by Zoom calls, uh, met with local legislators, got them to pass resolutions, educated them on what the National Infrastructure Bank does, and then took those legislators to their members of Congress. And that's how we got uh, people to sign on, for example, in New Mexico, in California, in Pennsylvania, and so forth. And another big push has been because uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, after it passed, then members of Congress realized there wasn't enough money in there. And legislators had these long lists of projects that were not funded. And when the when you intersect those two on Zoom calls, uh, it makes it really quite clear that we need this National Infrastructure Bank to top up the financing 
of all the rest of the infrastructure that's still not covered. Thank you. Great. I might have known that you did. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the question. We appreciate it. We also have tools on our website and we'll be flashing our website here uh, in a few minutes, but uh, we have some tools and downloadable brochures uh, for folks. Uh, um, so it'd be easy to download the brochure and then be able to, you know, print out a few and, and go to your local legislator because we under we understand it's a lot to try to memorize off of, a, you know, a Zoom call. But at any rate, um, let's go to Stephen Fry. Do you have a brief question, sir? A brief question is uh, for my clarification that, that um... I got, I've gotten comments, uh, tried to talk informally about the concept of, of uh, our National Infrastructure Bank push here. And um, also I've done some uh, research in the background and maybe one of the uh, economics professionals can educate me because uh, the comment that I got is, well, we also have state infrastructure banks. That's my question. Well, were they talking about uh, North Dakota because it's only one? one. But, uh, but at any rate, let's go to Prof <laughs> yeah, let's go to Professor Hockett. Would you like to address that? Um, I know that there are a number of state initiatives underway right now, but at the moment, um, we still only have one particularly strong and, and, and long-standing example, and that is the Bank of North Dakota, uh, which has been you know quite highly su successful. It's been there for uh, over a hundred years at this point. Um, this is kind of remarkable also because North Dakota, politically speaking, tends to be a red state, but uh, those who live there are very proud of the Bank of North Dakota. Um, my guess is that if you suggested getting rid of it, um, you would uh, probably be strung up or something, right? So um, they swear by it. There was actually a really interesting uh, report that came out in the, I think it was the, actually it was the Washington Post um, around April of 2020, at sort of the height of the, of the COVID pandemic. Um, and essentially they were reporting on the, the alacrity and the efficiency with which various banks had distributed PPP uh, loan money uh, from the federal government uh, to various businesses to kind of keep them running and keep people employed. Um, and by far the, the, the fastest acting, the least wasteful uh, and the most effective distributor of all of that PPP money turned out to be the Bank of North Dakota, whereas all the private sector banks had done much less well. Um, and the Wall Street Journal of all things, you know, the sort of the mouthpiece of, um, of the American financial services industry uh, itself uh, credited the Bank of North Dakota with having been uh, the best at this. So if people were being objective and, 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 and actually looking at performance rather than acting on the basis or opining on the basis of, of, of preconceptions, including false uh, preconceptions, they would recognize uh, that public banks just tend to work better, at least if they use the, the most sparkling example. So my understanding um, from uh, our friend Susan Harmon, who I believe is with us this evening, is that uh, they're poised uh, to begin a public bank uh, in San Francisco. There are other, of course, California initiatives um, underway, and there are various similar initiatives in other states uh, of the U.S., including uh, up here in New York, uh, where I am. But still, at this point, the primary example we have to go on is the Bank of North Dakota. One thing I would like to point out, and uh, I appreciate your comment, uh, to me and for, and I, I would, I would tend to think for all of us. Uh, we want to know, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, pushback we may get, and and by going in and and uh, I actually discovered a uh, a website link, a landing page off of the Ohio Department of Transportation that specifically is the Ohio State Infrastructure Bank. Can I, may I address that? That's Go ahead. Like, I appreciate you. any input I could get. I'll mute again. Thank you. Is it okay? If, Julie? Go ahead. No, go ahead, Ellen. Uh, so uh, California also has a state infrastructure and development bank, but it's a revolving fund. Most states have revolving funds that do infrastructure type things, but it doesn't have nearly the potential of a national infrastructure bank because it can't leverage its money. We tried to get a bill passed that would turn it into a state depository bank. If it's a depository, it can leverage its funds, like 10 to one or more than that. Right now, they've eliminated the capital or sorry, the reserve requirement. And the uh, like the Euro dollars don't have any capital requirement. They just create money on the books. So 
So that's why we want a bank, an actual depository bank. It has a lot more potential. And I did want to just say one other thing about the, um, the project in Philadelphia, the subway. That would be the perfect thing for something funded with something similar to a revenue bond. But in other words, capital or um, um, backed by the revenues that would be produced by the subway. Because look at the number of people that would ride that subway and the income that you would get from it. So what you need is a bank that's capable of creating money on its books, which is what banks do, create the money as credit. It's, you know, it's created, a, the loan is, becomes a deposit on one side of the bank's books, uh, you know, as a liability to itself and it's an asset on the other side. So the bank creates the money as credit, it's paid back from the revenues generated by the project built with the, with the funds. So that's what we're talking about here. And, and it's like the California Infrastructure and Development Bank, last time I looked, I think it had 30 million, sorry, I've forgotten, 30 million or 300 million, but it doesn't have much for, for capital. Not, a, not that's enough. the biggest thing that I noticed and, is you're talking millions and not billions. Yeah. Let alone and trillions. Thank you, Stephen, for your question. And that is why we have really smart people like Ellen Brown on our uh, video here because she's able to expertly answer those questions. So thank you. Now, I do understand that Lamar Lemons from Michigan is has now unmuted his phone. Lamar, are you there? Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, it just in Michigan, a uh, quick report out, if, if you will. Uh, we have now three of our uh, of Congress people who are co-sponsors and we have for in the queue, if you will, in the in the uh, persons of Haley Stevens and uh, Levin, and um, uh, the Levin is uh, uh, is outgoing, but uh, if if it uh, happens during lame duck, we also have uh, uh, um, Alyssa Slotkin, uh, uh, Slotkin, and um, and and Kildy, uh in the queue, in that the. Senators, I, I work for the uh, Michigan State Senate, so I talked to both uh, the uh, ranking member um, uh, of the uh, the Democrats as well as the ranking Dem on appropriations. Um, who the, the ranking Dem on appropriations is working to uh, help uh, Melissa uh, uh, Alyssa Slocken in her in her race and, and doing her debate prep, and he's going to ask her uh, specifically to uh, co-sponsor. Uh, you should know that Michigan, uh, the every Democrat signed on to a, re a resolution to memorialize Congress to um, uh, pass um, HR 3339 and, uh, and also with two uh, Republicans. So it's a bipartisan resolution to memorialize Congress to, uh, to, to pass 3339. Um, and so that's where we are uh, in my report out. Um, within the next uh, a week or two, uh, I anticipate getting uh, at least two of the four to um, uh, take action and become co-sponsors. Wonderful, that is awesome, Lamar. We really appreciate all your work there in Michigan. Um, and I do wanna point out that's the middle of the country, but we are on the East Coast, the West Coast, the North, the South and the Middle. So we are out there in pretty much every state trying to spread the word. So now quickly, we wanna take another question. Um, Janice Richards has her hand up. Janice, do you have a quick question? Make a comment, hi. Sure. Um, thank you for the wonderful call. Um, in the 90s, President Clinton approved, I guess it was 10 or 15 state infrastructure banks and Texas happened to be one of those approved. So Nathan Debeno found that information for us working in diligently in Texas to see what we could do. And we got all excited, but the bank has a $50 million budget. And as Ellen pointed out, it's probably a similar bank in California that exists under similar uh, origin uh, story. Um, the exciting news would be if whatever we could do to turn that into a state infrastructure bank, in fact, instead of just in theory and really useless and pretty much it's just for uh, highways, of course, to support oil and uh, highway construction and the automotive industry. But if we could turn that into something, which I'll 
visit tomorrow on our meeting, uh, public banking meeting, and maybe we, I don't know, or just separately with Public Banking Institute, if there's a plan that, uh, that we can actually do something with that bank or figure out a way to request a huge uh, increase in budget, that would be great. Right. But I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Good point. And we would be happy to help facilitate any of those conversations uh, if we can. So Thank now, um, quickly, we're going to go to Susan Harmon. Do you have a brief comment or question? I do. Uh, just a warning that we keep saying infrastructure banks, and every infrastructure bank that I know of is really a revolving loan fund. As Ellen said, that's true of the California iBank. I'm guessing it's true of the Texas bank. Um, they should not be called banks because they aren't. They're revolving loan funds. So beware. Well, Words matter. So thank you, Susan, for pointing that out. Okay, um, next we're going to go on to Joe Polito, who has his hand up. Joe, do you have a quick question or comment? Joe? Yeah, a um, couple things. Um, I think Mariana Mazzucato is very supportive of public banks, and that's a good person to have on your side. Um, and the, uh, <clears throat> sorry, um, uh, Ellen once did a, uh, a great profile of uh, Comer, which is a Canadian uh, organization for monetary and economic reform for the newsletter. And um, uh, they, they wanted to use the Bank of Canada, much like you're describing. And it turns out that in Canada, the, the, the central bank is allowed to support the provinces, which is the equivalent of the state and even municipalities. And during the COVID crisis, they did support the provinces. So I don't know if that's an avenue that you can explore with the Fed. Um, and finally, uh, uh, a lot of the organizations, monetary reform organizations talk about um, money as being um, a creature of the law. And it seems to me you are uh, exploring very constructively a different avenue of that uh, strategy. Um, Governments uh, issue um, professional licenses, they issue building permits, they issue laws, they issue all sorts of things. And one of the things they can issue is money and which gives you authority over uh, resources and services. And uh, I commend you for finding this innovative way of doing that. Thank you for your comments, we appreciate it. And uh, we've taken up a lot of your time this evening. I have one more uh, final question I would like to address to Professor Hockett and Alfeka Mutardi. And that is, uh, once a national infrastructure bank is created, how long will it, it take for us to start seeing results in the economy? Can you, ha can you hazard a guess at that, Alfeka or um, Professor Hockett? Well, maybe I could take a stab at it first. Uh, the, the bill, as it's constructed at the moment, has an emergency clause in it so that we can get started right away. Um, that is, we won't have to have all of the regulatory framework in place for the bank to actually start giving out loans. We can give out emergency loans. Certainly, we should start with emergency loans for places like Jackson, Mississippi, any place that doesn't have water for farmers uh, to make sure that our food supply doesn't shrill up and die. Uh, all of these are emergencies right now. We have a whole bunch of bridges that are about to collapse. Uh, these things are all in the books. They've been standing on the books for the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, we can get started on the projects right away. Uh, and uh, all of this will have an impact right away on the economy, because uh, if we're in a recession, if uh, Powell has had his way and we're ha and we've had, you know, high unemployment uh, after all the excruciating pain we went through after COVID, uh, we can hire people right away to start working on these projects and train and let them earn while they learn in a new uh, life's family sustaining career. Uh, so that should have a really immediate impact on unemployment, on improving worker pay, and, uh, and getting our growth rates back up to par. Yeah, I'm with Alfeka on that. I, I think I'll just echo her. I mean, if you've got um, a national infrastructure bank that can kind of target uh, places all over the country, uh, and if you say we're going to start uh, where the needs are most urgent and, and most obvious, where in fact, there would be likely to be uh, emergency authority to get to work right away because there's a sort of exigency that we're facing that could actually result in deaths and you know sort of serious tolls to to human health and the like then you could see results quite quickly i mean right now of course jackson and flint are, are quite conspicuous cases 
Um, I grew up in, in, in New Orleans, um, and of course you guys will remember um, that when Katrina struck in 2005, the Ninth Ward in particular was terribly hard hit. Um, and as, as usual, it's, it's a part of the city that's, um, you know, that's inhabited largely by um, uh, groups that have been traditionally discriminated against, in this case, of course, African-American folk again. Um, and that was a massive infrastructure failure that resulted in deaths and cataclysm. And it was as though this wasn't the United States, at least not the United States that middle-class white folk had always thought that it was, um, but that non-middle-class white folk could have told you it's been sort of all along. Um, if we were looking to all of those areas where we really need to work fast and immediately, we would start seeing immediate results. Um, and, you know, an economist would, would tell you that you get a lot more bang for your buck, so to speak, in those places too, because there's just so much catching up to do. Um, and then once the sort of hardest hit or the, the most vulnerable areas begin to look like they're improving and things are getting better and there's less sort of cataclysm all around, then, of course, by that point, we, we could have get, we can we will be able to have geared up um, to start doing work in areas that are sort of less struck by, you know, less, less sort of vulnerable to emergency, but that are nevertheless in need of improvement, say like a LaGuardia airport in New York, which wasn't exactly an emergency shape, but was just unbelievably bad. Um, so, you know, start with the areas where human life and human health are imperiled again, like Jackson and Flint right now, or the Ninth Ward in New Orleans before 2005. And then once you've got all that taken care of, you can start looking at other places where things are quite as, um, you know, kind of lethally dangerous, but that are in really severe need of, uh, of improvement. And I think we'd start seeing change immediately. That, and I'm sure that would be welcome news to municipalities, cities, localities around the country. So I'd like to uh, go ahead and uh, wrap it up at this point. And we've got a couple of slides we want to share with folks. Um, uh, first of all, this is the op-ed that we are going to be placing in uh, Mississippi media. And again, just to addressing how a national infrastructure bank uh, could be used to help address the water crisis that's currently ongoing there in Jackson, Mississippi. I know, um, uh, I believe a senator from my state uh, called in today and um, said that um, um, we could add his name to this op-ed. So um, really appreciate everybody who has um, volunteered and asked their representatives to uh, join on in supporting um, our neighbors in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, uh, next slide. Um, there's uh, the number to call your member of Congress. Certainly the more phone calls they get, the better. They do tally them up and, and uh, take note of it. And so if you and, and your family and friends can call uh, Congress and ask them to co-sponsor HR 3339, that would be great. We would appreciate it. Next slide. Um, for more information, um, here's our website, our Facebook page, our Twitter, our email, our phone number. So if you would like a Zoom call for uh, your local representatives, your legislators, you and your friends, your, your bridge club, we would be happy to do that for you. Just give us a call or email the office and we'll be happy to work with you and get something up, set up in your neighborhood. And then uh, did we have the slide for our um, 16 co-sponsors plus uh, Representative Danny Davis out of Illinois that um, introduced our bill originally? Um, we had set a goal um, earlier this year to hit 20 co-sponsors. I think it was by the end of the summer. So, you know, we're pretty darn close with that 17 and we've got more on the list that we're um, trying to get to sign up and would love to have a Congressman from your state um, on board with that also. So that kind of brings me to the end of our presentation tonight. Please visit our website if you're so inclined. We um, are accepting donations. They help us pay for our media around the country. Certainly the more advertising we can do, the more effective we can be in our presentation. So um, thanks again, everyone. And appreciate your attendance tonight.